Welcome everyone. We'll get started in about 15, 20 seconds to let people flow into the platform. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Scott Davis. I'm the Senior Vice President of Industry Engagement for AERS. Before I get started, I would like to mention that there will be some time dedicated at the end for questions and answers. As you think of questions to ask, please enter them in the QA section of the platform rather than the chat section, as we may not see them there. Eris, as you all may know, is an environmental risk data and information service company that provides high quality reports to help manage and assess environmental risk. Recently, we added a new product called Scriva, an intuitive, flexible report authoring platform that is fully integrated with the Eris data to save you time. Today, we'll be discussing some of the unique challenges and considerations related to dry cleaning site remediation. We are truly fortunate to have Mike Marcone here with us today. For over 25 years, Mike has been the senior principal with In Control Technologies, helping clients navigate the complex world of environmental regulations and site restoration. He has helped numerous clients develop strategies to convert brownfield properties into viable real estate investments. Mike has vast experience in assisting dry cleaners and property owners who have historical or current dry cleaning plants address the environmental contamination commonly commonly associated with historical waste management activities. He also has an extensive relationship with many of the vendors and suppliers in the dry cleaning business, providing him the unparalleled knowledge of the operational practices in the dry cleaning industry. Mike has served as an environmental expert on over 40 cases involving dry cleaners. Additionally, he has conducted numerous environmental compliance audits and managed over 500 dry cleaning investigation and remediation product, projects. Mike has used this experience to develop a number of streamlined assessment procedures to provide cost-effective site characterizations to help streamline site restoration. So with further delay, without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to you, Mike. All right, thank you very much, Scott, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the environmental brown bag regarding everything dry cleaning, everything you wanted to know. Um, again, uh, just to kind of set the stage before we get started, here's a little outline of what we plan to talk about during the, the next 45 minutes. As you can see from this outline, there's a lot of material there. I just want to acknowledge up front um, that we are not going to be going into extreme detail on any of these topics. We're going to uh, sort of give it the 50,000 foot elevation review, kind of talk about the history of dry cleaning, the different types of dry cleaning equipment that's out there, uh, talk about due diligence issues, um, uh, things that you have to deal with when you're considering dry cleaners or looking at dry cleaners. And then lastly, we're going to finish up with some of the emerging issues facing dry cleaners and along with uh, some of the new contaminant issues that are coming out. Um, so I think before we get started, uh, the first thing uh, we should do is make sure uh, we all understand uh, the term dry cleaning. Um, Dry cleaning starts uh, a long time ago, but the term simply means cleaning without water. So the dry cleaning process, unlike what we have at home, at home you have a washer and a dryer, you put your clothes in the washer, water and soap come together, wash the clothes and you transfer it over to your dryer. Uh, here in the dry cleaning process, uh, we fill the washing machine instead of with water, uh, we fill it with a solvent and the solvent is used instead of water, hence the name uh, dry cleaning because it's dry without water. A few fun facts about the history of dry cleaning to get us going. Uh, the first recorded evidence of dry cleaning, again, cleaning without water, dated back to Pompeii, 79 AD. 
where they used a combination of ammonia uh, derived from urine and fuller's earth to clean the wool clothes, the clothes that they wore at the time. Of course, this predated uh, the eruption of the volcano, and uh, but we've recovered some of the information to find out. Really, today's uh, dry cleaning that we think of evolved in the early 1800s. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Jennings, a tailor in New York City, started to experiment with the use of solvents to clean clothes because he realized that uh, regular washing practices were damaging delicate garments. Um, he later filed a patent and called it dry scouring and not dry cleaning. Of, of interesting fact, this was the very first African-American to hold, Mr. Jennings is the very first African-American to hold a patent uh, in the US. Sort of at the same time, later on in the 1800s, a gentleman in Paris, France, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jolly, uh, also is accredited with um, starting uh, or inventing uh, the dry cleaning process. I really think the credit probably should go to his maid, who at dinner one night accidentally knocked over the kerosene lantern, which spilled kerosene onto the tablecloth. Uh, uh, Jolly noticed that the after the kerosene had dried, that the stains in the tablecloth had disappeared. And more importantly, the cloth was not damaged. So from that accidental spillage of kerosene, he starts and coins the term dry cleaning uh, for the dry cleaning process. So in history, overview of history, kind of looking through the dry cleaning process from that time forward, people experimented with a number of different types of, of solvents, including turpentine, benzene, kerosene, uh, even talking to my mother who's 93 years old, tells me when she was a little girl, they would use kerosene to clean their clothes in a bucket out in the backyard. Uh, but along comes uh, William Stoddard, uh, who is credited with developing a non-gasoline based solvent, which we call today Stoddard solvent. Unfortunately, World War I comes along. After World War I, there's a significant shortage in solvent. And so uh, we start to transition into a new solvent, perchloroethylene, which was uh, invented by Michael Faraday. In the 1940s becomes a big transition from Stoddard solvent to uh, uh, perchloroethylene. So today, what chemicals are used? Uh, the predominant chemicals used in the dry cleaning industry today um, include uh, pre predominantly tetrachloroethylene. It's still the predominant solvent used according to the records, uh, but also Stoddard solvent, the second most common and quickly catching up and probably will surpass the PERC very soon. And then we have uh, other solvents, glycol, ether, silicone, and carbon dioxide. And lastly, new into the marketplace is a, a professional wet cleaning, which you see the machine in the picture here. This is a transition from solvent back to a water-based uh, process. So this is the evolution of the dry cleaning process. We started out with Stoddard, transitioned to PERC, and now we're going back to Stoddard and other chemicals. So we have to keep in mind that the uh, dry cleaning process peaked probably in the 1970s and 1980s, maybe even into the early 1990s. Uh, significant regulatory change with the uh, introduction of the RECRA third third rules, uh, which made PERC a hazardous constituent. Uh, we start to see an impact in the dry cleaning business. Uh, during the peak, uh, 80 to 85% of the dry cleaners used PERC. So it was by far the most common. Today, the uh, record suggests that it's 60 to 65% of dry cleaners use PERC. I actually think it's probably in the 50s uh, based on my own experience here in the, in the Houston area. So we have to understand that increasing regulations, 
uh, contamination issues and other pressures have dropped. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that in the U.S. there's currently listed 20, 000, over 20,000 dry cleaning shops that employ roughly 160,000 workers. These statistics predate COVID, so these are probably incorrect, but uh, it gives us an idea. To keep in mind, most of these 160,000 workers lack any formal training, especially regarding the use of hazardous materials and hazardous chemicals. So when we tend to want to ask questions of these, uh, of the operators, they're not fully understanding necessarily the questions as an environmental professional that we're asking them. Now, uh, the industry is changing. Uh, so in some areas, they're actually requiring the operators to have some level of formal training before they uh, are allowed to operate the equipment. So we've talked a little bit about the past. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the future. Uh, I believe this is the opinion of Mike, uh, that several of the states are starting to ban or limit the use of PERC, which is going to further reduce the number of PERC dry cleaners. Uh, we actually have communities, some communities are providing incentives but I think in addition to this, just the uh, 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 economic demand, supply and demand, demand is way down for dry cleaning services. Um, we don't wear suit and tie and suit pants to work anymore. We wear casual clothes. Uh, and so fewer of us are taking our clothes to the dry cleaning business. We also see uh, a lot of pressure with the uh, regulatory framework from EPA. Um, there was uh, TOSCA or the Toxic Substance Control Act uh, did a review of TCE and was going to ban TCE in certain uses, uh, including spotting agents at dry cleaners. Uh, that has been uh, delayed, but there is plans to do the same thing with PCE or PERC, and uh, it could be a chance that PERC is outlawed. Uh, the other thing to kind of keep in mind is the cost to cleanup of a dry cleaner is very expensive. So these uh, combining that with the shrink shrinking industry is uh, making the future dry cleaning in industry a much smaller industry and a much more focused industry. So now that we've talked about that, let's kind of review the equipment um, that we see. Uh, the dry cleaning equipment, there's basically five generations of dry cleaning equipment that you could encounter when visiting uh, a dry cleaner. Uh, the first is called the first generation. Actually, prior to the first generation was a bucket or a tub with just kerosene or um, some sort of solvent in it, and they would wash the clothes and hang them on the clothesline. But this is the starting of the mechanical equipment. So our first is wet to dry, meaning that we put the clothes in the washing machine, they come out wet and we transfer the wet clothes to the dryer. It's also called transfer equipment because we're actually transferring the clothes from one piece of equipment to the other. Uh, the picture on the bottom is a picture of a uh, petroleum solvent transfer equipment. Uh, piece of equipment with the door of opening was the washing machine and the piece of equipment next to it is the uh, a reclaimer or dryer where they reclaim solvent and then the picture on the tops is the filter uh, system which that where they filtered the solvent. Uh, the problem with this equipment is it used a lot of solvent. In the dry cleaning industry they talk about increasing the mileage of the solvent which is a term used to suggest that we can uh, extend the useful life of the solvent and get more pounds of clothes per gallon of solvent. So along from the transfer becomes the first generation or what we call second generation of dry to dry equipment. The clothes go into the washing machine, they're washed and dried in the same piece of equipment, and then they come out. The second generation equipment um, still did not have solvent recovery built into it. In general, the solvent uh, was uh, vented, uh, but dry cleaners had equipment to try to recover the solvent. The third generation was the first closed loop system. This is where we integrate 
the solvent recovery into the equipment. Uh, fourth and fifth generations uh, incorporated refrigerated condensers. These are a much higher efficiency uh, equipment to recover the solvent along with carbon absorbers. And so we've now increased the efficiency. The main difference between the fourth and the fifth generation is safety interlocks that are integrated into the dry cleaning equipment to prevent the operator from opening the equipment unless certain internal conditions are satisfied. Um, and, and so what we see is from the very first generation was a high use, uh, high release piece of equipment to the fifth generation uh, equipment, which is really designed to maintain and keep uh, all of the solvent uh, within the confines of the footprint of the equipment. Um, unfortunately, as we will talk in just a little bit, uh, not, the solvent doesn't always stay within the confines, especially when they're handling waste. So let's talk a little bit about the regulatory rules. As I said, the, uh, in the 90s, we come in with the record regulations that classify PERC as a hazardous waste in the uh, three um, stages of, of managing that. So the waste from all dry cleaning equipment, and that's both the PERC and Stoddard solvent waste would be regulated under 40 CFR 260 through 262. And then the air emissions are regulated under part 60 and part 63. Part 60 deals with petroleum uh, dry cleaners part 63 with uh, with perk uh, dry cleaning. Now, uh, also there's regulations that ban uh, dry cleaning in residential properties. This includes uh, hotels, motels, and uh, hospitals. Um, so there are some other regulations out there that also limit and restrict the use of dry cleaning. And then we get to the Clean Water Act, which controls both direct and, and indirect discharges to surface water as well as storm water. And so, again, we could spend a whole day just going through these or at least 45 minutes going through these, but we're not going to. Uh, regulatory background, this could explode into a multi-day session in itself to discuss the differences between the various uh, different state regulatory agencies. Uh, the state regulations typically mimic the federal rules. They, states have different registration requirements. Um, the states also have different cleanup rules and, um, and also some of the states actually ban uh, the use of perks such as California, Minnesota, and some states will also require special training and operators. So each state is different and you'd really need to consult the states to determine uh, the rules that apply. So I said that the advantage of the fifth generation equipment, which is the piece of equipment shown in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, is that the uh, perk is really contained in the piece of equipment. Unfortunately, there are different waste streams that are generated uh, during the process. And these include spent solvent still bottoms, which we'll look at, uh, the filter cartridges um, and contaminated water from the separator. So uh, a little uh, uh, evaporative cooker, also these dry cleaners have as a piece of equipment that a lot of them install to boil off the separator water, which the lower uh, right-hand corner is a picture of one of these. Uh, these were famous for boiling over or, uh, or, or spilling. And then they had drums where they stored the waste and, and used uh, filters. So these are common waste streams that one would encounter at a dry cleaner site. From a, a due diligence standpoint, what I found for years, the dry cleaner was overlooked uh, by many environmental professionals as a potential source of contamination. Um, What's surprising is through the 90s and then into the early 2000s, I would review phase ones that would indicate that the dry cleaner said they never spilt or that it looked clean inside. Uh, I think today though, the environmental professionals are, are uh, acutely aware that dry cleaners, especially dry cleaners that use perchloroethylene or historically use perchloroethylene are an environmental concern. 
And, and also dry cleaner was one of the common anchor tenants for a large shopping center. I mean, you wanted a grocery store and a dry cleaner and everybody else was extra. So most of the larger strip centers or shopping centers had a dry cleaner within them. And we also have to keep in mind, dry cleaners also can generate fairly significant volumes of waste. Uh, EPA estimates the waste to be around 600 plus gallons per year uh, of waste. Um, the other thing is the dry cleaner cost to clean up are fairly expensive, ranging between five to $700,000. So the hard facts. Uh, the dry cleaning business is very competitive. Um, historically, dry cleaners were unaware of the chemical hazards of PERC. I know when I worked uh, with some of the suppliers, they used to tell their customers to pour the PERC out on the ground, use the still bottoms to kill the weeds along the fence line, and dump the DE earth from your old filters into the dumpsters. And that's what dry cleaners did for years. And even still today, dry cleaners take the separator water which they think is just water and pour it out the back of the dry cleaner. So poor housekeeping along with bad waste management practices leads to a large number of releases. Now this picture is a, a picture of a, a dry cleaner. You see two pieces of equipment here. These are petroleum machines. This is a fairly upscale dry cleaner. Uh, and the fact that they have the two machines a uh, very clean shop. Unfortunately, it was historically used perk and has contamination. Um, EPA studies, along with the State Coalition for Remediation of Dry Cleaners, estimates that 75% of the approximately 30,000 dry cleaners currently in operation have contamination. And I would say that that's the 75% is probably the perk dry cleaners, and I would actually state that number is probably a little bit higher. But it doesn't include historical dry cleaners. And there's estimated to be some 30,000, I mean, I'm sorry, some 900,000 historical sites likely existed. And so if we use those numbers of 500 to 700,000 and just rely on the 500,000, which is a realistic number in some cases, with just the active dry cleaners, that's an $11 billion problem. If we take the 90,000 added in there, it now becomes a $45 billion problem. That's to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem that we're facing with the dry cleaners. So let's look inside a dry cleaner real quick so we can understand what the potential issues are. So here's a uh, fifth generation dry to dry uh, dry cleaning machine in the upper left hand corner. Um, here we see a white rag stuffed under the door because the gasket is leaking on this dry cleaning machine and the dry cleaner installed that rag to absorb the dry cleaning solvent. By the way, this was one of those dry cleaner sites where a phase one was done. And the phase one consultant said that it was clean inside and no evidence of a release. And again, it is. This was a very clean looking dry cleaner. The next picture going clockwise in the upper uh, right hand corner, uh, we see these five gallon buckets. This is the still bottoms that comes out of the uh, still on the back of the dry cleaning machine, which you can see on the right hand of that picture. This dry cleaner, the pump that was supposed to automatically pump the salt, the sludge from the still into that 55 gallon drum wasn't working. Located just behind the five gallon buckets is used filters where the dry cleaner set the used filters on the ground uh, waiting for them to be disposed. Uh, again, we see the spotting board, spotting agents and the spotting agents commonly used whatever solvent they were using in the dry cleaning machine, along with TCE were common spotting agents. And then the last picture is the 55 gallon drum, um, which contained uh, the still bottoms and other waste streams. And then you can see the used filters sitting next to it. So when you're inside a dry cleaner, these are the things that you're looking for because they're what lead to the soil and the groundwater contamination, which we see in this picture. 
Um, we see the machine, the 55 gallon drum, the spotting agents, the dumpster outside, uh, a lint trap, which is used to uh, filter lint out of the laundry water. A lot of times the dry cleaners dump the waste down uh, the laundry sump and ends up getting into the sanitary sewer. These releases quickly migrate uh, through the soil. Um, the clay in the uh, site is not an effective barrier for perk, unfortunately. Um, uh, past studies we've done have shown that the perk migrates rather quickly through the clay and actually breaks down the bond of the clay. And a lot of times you'll find mushy clay underneath the uh, foundation, a very soft uh, clay underneath the uh, dry cleaning equipment where spills have occurred. Um, the other thing we have is a, a site where a chemical uh, supplier had a rupture in a tank, uh, a 55 gallon drum or tote, and uh, within hours, uh, the perk had, had penetrated through the concrete slab, contaminated the soil, and within two days, uh, when we were able to get out to do the groundwater investigation, had already impacted the shallow groundwater. Perk moves very fast and very quickly in the environment. Now, the problem is it's not just an issue on site. Uh, the perk goes down, as we see in this picture, and flows rapidly through the soil, gets into the groundwater, but then groundwater flow conveys the perk. And not only can it contaminate one, but it can contaminate multiple units as the contaminant mass predominantly as a napple flows through the soil. Now, I also want us to keep in mind that it is rare to find like free floating product or free denappled uh, at the bottom of transmissive units. These are mostly micro droplets as the contaminant mass uh, transfers through, which is why it's so difficult to clean up. Um, in, in my years, I've only found a bean apple at one dry cleaner site. I'm not saying they're not out there. It's just not very common. The other thing is the radial uh, footprint of it is fairly small, so it's easy to miss in the investigation. So as the contaminant mass uh, migrates in the groundwater, we also have vapors that migrate up from these plumes and can impact the neighboring property. So we have the contaminant mass on site, groundwater transfer port off site, and now we're contaminating the neighbor's property. So when we're looking at phase one site assessments, uh, just some things to keep in mind. Uh, one of the important things is when did the dry cleaner begin operations? Uh, my experience is pre-1950 dry cleaners likely use petroleum or stoddard solvent. Again, it's not until the late 1940s that we really see the big switch from PERC to, uh, I mean, from stoddard solvent to PERC. Post-1950s, the dry cleaners most likely use PERC because it was the uh, wonder solvent for the retail dry cleaner. Now, linen service companies typically did not use PERC. They used petroleum-based solvents just because of the sheer mass of things that they're cleaning. Most of their linens are white. They didn't have some of the problems that they had. So you'll find that most linen or, 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 or uniform laundry services would use petroleum-based solvents. Now, if the real problem comes in when the dry cleaner is no longer present on site, and in that case, what we have to do is we have to look for physical evidence uh, on the property. And these include things as laundry sumps, boiler rooms, floor staining, bolting patterns in the floor, piping structures in the ceiling. And you really have to do a deep dive into the tenant spaces to sometimes see these. Unfortunately, a lot of these uh, facilities have been uh, have flooring over, have been converted maybe into a, uh, a different type of store. And so it becomes very difficult. So then you just have to kind of look at the physical layout of the property. Remembering that dry cleaners, delivery vans usually come to the back. 
or where if there's no access to the back, they would come to the front. But the equipment was generally located in a place um, away from the front uh, so that the customer didn't get heated by the heat generated by the dry cleaner. Delivery doors are another good place, drum rings and other items. Then we get into the site assessment activities. And again, this is when we're doing the phase twos or, or additional assessments. And usually during this phase, you're doing uh, hand augers, push probes, some pouring, and we're just trying to get an idea. And again, the target is to focus on these release points. Groundwater samples generally collected from temporary groundwater monitoring wells, open soil borings, again, being careful that if you're going through a source in the soil, you may overestimate the concentration in groundwater. So care needs to be taken. And again, we typically focus the compound list just to the, a target list of compounds. Uh, again, these may change in the future, but right now for park dry cleaners, it's PCE and the decom uh, compounds, TCE, cis and trans, uh, one, two DCE, one, one DCE and vinyl chloride. And rarely do we find very much 1,1 DCE. Stoddard solvents, again, you're gonna have a wider range of VOCs and uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. The uh, next thing is you've gone through, you've done the assessment and you found out that um, you have a contaminated dry cleaner. And I found that over 95% of the dry cleaners, the PERC dry cleaners, are contaminated, even the ones that have only operated the fifth generation equipment. So typically what we're talking about is soil excavation and removal for source removal um, or soil vapor extraction in some cases, chemical oxidation, um, bioremediation. Uh, in situ bioremediation, uh, I haven't seen a lot of great uh, experience with that, but some external uh, uh, ex situ mixing um, zero valent iron is listed as a technology. It's not one that I've used for treatment of soils. Uh, typically, we see the uh, zero valent iron uh, used in the groundwater. And then on the groundwater side, uh, the pump and treat, um, multi phase extraction. Again, this is using typically a dual phase high vacuum extraction system. Now, we personally use the first two items to help use some of the other technologies that are going on, whether we're air sparging or using bioremediation, chemical oxidation. The pump and treat and the uh, high vacuum extraction technologies allow us to disperse these chemicals and provide a greater uh, treatment zone that are out there. There's also some experimental technologies that are out there like co-solvent extraction, um, also some nanotechnologies with microcarbon being injected. And I think these, um, these emerging technologies show a lot of promise. And again, we could have a whole day just on talking about technologies for treating chlorinated solvents. Uh, and then lastly, the reactive barrier walls, zero valence iron walls, again, uh, a, a highly successful technology, fairly expensive. And uh, all of these technologies have uh, their proper use when they're applicable and when they're not. Again, the idea is to eliminate uh, risk and exposure and the inflammation of these technologies would be uh, uh, associated with the um, actual application on the site, which you would take into consideration physical limitations, permeabilities, types of soils, what the overlying structures are, whether you have buildings, uh, residential and, and otherwise. Now to break into uh, sort of a, a different area of conversation, several states, there's 13 states that have some form of dry cleaner regulatory remediation programs, specifically two dry cleaners. Uh, these, these states uh, form the state coalition uh, for the remediation of dry cleaners. And uh, they're a great resource for information. If you're looking for information, 
uh, on uh, cleaning up dry cleaners in your area. For example, if you're in Kansas, I would I would go to Kansas and find out what they have or uh, to the state coalition. Uh, their database is kind of old right now, but uh, I do understand that they're still active and um, but they do have some good good information on there that I've found. So uh, use your resources that are out there. While the formal programs in the member states vary, most of these programs include annual registration fees, fees on dry cleaning solvents, or they collect gross receipt taxes. Now, the problem with these three items is as the number of dry cleaners reduce, the number, the amount of solvent being used and the fewer clothes we have dry clean, then the actual funds going into the program start to diminish. And in fact, some of the states have already acknowledged that with COVID, and the two year sort of uh, hiatus on dry cleaning or the use of dry cleaners has significantly impacted uh, their, their fund. Uh, I, I think this is gonna start to show up in the next few years, um, but I think states are going to have to look at alternative ways of funding these programs. Again, this is not a, a small problem. We know that it's a $40 billion problem sitting out there. Now, the el there are eligibility requirements for funding. Some states have specific requirements like you can't be using PERC anymore at your, at your dry cleaner site. And again, those requirements vary from state to state. Uh, they all deal with prioritizing regulations, implementing the program are either on a state lead or through a reimbursement program. And but all of these states have a regulatory program specific to the dry cleaner. Now, the benefits, the major benefits offered to the dry cleaner participants are some level of liability protection and funds to help with cleaning up the site. So this provides incentives for dry cleaners to actually report or landowners to actually report and enroll these programs in there. So we can actually find the sites that are quote unquote, really bad and have a immediate threat to human health or the environment. Most programs require some sort of pollution prevention or best management practices to prevent future problems. And so these are the good aspects of the program. They, they have very many benefits. I think one of the downsides is going to be the funding issue. Another downside is emerging contaminants. And I think we have to keep in mind that um, the dry cleaning industry uh, is, again, a very low margin industry, produces very little uh, revenue um, uh, for the owners. And there's a lot of pressures for people to uh, get out of the dry cleaning industry. And then along comes a new emerging contaminant with, uh, with the PFOS or the polyfluoroalkyl substances. Now, in general, we do not associate these chemicals or this group of chemicals with dry cleaners, but the state of Florida through their uh, dry cleaner program did a study regarding PFOS and the likelihood of finding PFOS at dry cleaners. They looked at 15 facilities that were eligible for state cleanup, and they acknowledge that while PFOS is not typically used at dry cleaners, it is found. Now, the other thing is that the dry cleaners, and, and again, looking for business opportunities, may have applied res water resistant coatings and to fabrics uh, that for the clothes that were brought in, just like dry cleaners used to do shoe repairs, shoe polishing. This was another source of revenue the dry cleaners would uh, actually do waterproofing on clothes, fabrics, and things like that. And these would commonly contain PFOS compounds. The Florida PFOS study looked at both the virgin unused uh, products and spent dry cleaning products. So it looks at the products coming into the dry cleaner as well as the products leaving the dry cleaner. And I, I think it's important, I'm gonna kind of make a statement that I think the jury is not 100%. I, 
I think it's only about 75% because there's still issues with um, quality control and the labs getting to where the point that they can actually effectively analyze for the PFOS compounds and whether there's cross-contamination. However, I believe the weight of evidence that was that comes out of this study shows that PFOS is probably going to be a contaminant concern for dry cleaners in the future. And if we just look at virgin cleaning products, the products that are coming into the facility, which includes the soaps, the solvents, the spotting agents, the different products that they use, two out of seven facilities contain some detectable level of PFOS in these products. And, and again, these are virgin products. These are not spent products where the PFOS could have originated from the dry cleaning process or the laundry process. It was detected in six out of seven of the facilities in their dry cleaning waste. So this is the either the separator water or the still bottoms that comes off of the, off of the dry cleaning machine, six out of seven. Uh, PFOS compounds from treated fabrics are likely coming off the fabrics during the, the dry cleaning process. Now, a lot of these compounds have been phased out over the years, but they still are showing up in the dry cleaner. The Florida study went even further and evaluated in virgin and spent products. And what they found is one out of four laundry detergents contained PFOS. These are your detergents, not your solvents. PFOS was detected in every wastewater discharge sample. So this is the water going into the sanitary sewer system, not the waste off of the dry cleaning equipment. So every single one of them had PFOS in the, in the wastewater. So this could be coming off of even the wet laundry side of the cleaners. And again, PFOS likely from treated clothing that's being washed at the dry cleaners. Now, the, the interesting thing was PFOS was also even detected at low concentrations in the incoming potable water at most of the facilities. And this is where I start to question, is it in the water systems? There is some arguments that it is and some proof that it is, but this could also be a sign of poor sampling practices. And again, not being in depthly familiar, I just say that these, these are types of questions that still need to be answered. But based on the uh, predominance of the evidence, I would strongly suggest that the contaminants are originating from the, the uh, um, dry cleaning process, the process itself, and not necessarily from the chemicals from the clothes. So let's summarize real quickly what we've talked about. Dry cleaning's been around since at least 79 AD. Of course, we don't use urine and fuller's earth anymore to clean our clothes. But uh, in, the, in the early 1800s through the mid 1800s, we transitioned into using solvents to clean our clothes and hence the invention of the dry cleaning process. Um, Pre-1950s, I think you'll find dry cleaners predominantly use petroleum or stoddard solvent. And again, with the advent of the space age and new technology in the 1950s, we bring in this wonderful new solvent perchloroethylene or perk because it cleans clothes like never before. And even still to this day, dry cleaners will tell you that perk is by far the best cleaning solvent on the market. Now, when you're looking at dry cleaners, you have to keep in mind potential source areas, dry cleaning machines, laundry sumps, boiler rooms, filter and waste storage areas, lint traps. I think lint traps are one of the most overlooked areas. Um, and then also the, where the waste was stored back in the days. That's hard because we don't know what they did back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. State dry cleaner programs are available and encourage uh, owner operators and landowner participation, which encourages uh, people to come forth with their properties and make them known. Um, and so this is uh, a quick uh, 45 minute, actually we're at 42 minutes, uh, overview of the dry cleaning process. Um, hopefully I was able to uh, share a few nuggets, maybe uh, shared some information that you didn't know. 
but right now what I'd like to do is go ahead and transfer it back to Scott and uh, Scott will take it from here. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, we have a few questions. Let's go ahead and get over to those and uh, we'll get start, starting that. So first question was carbon tech, tetrachloride and trichloroethane ever used in dry cleaning? So carbon tetrachloride was one of the uh, solvents that early on solvents that was used. It's not a very common solvent. Uh, the other one, I believe you said, Scott, was trichloroethylene. Correct. Uh, trichloroethylene was not a common solvent. I'm not saying that dry cleaners didn't use it. I was in a store where one dry cleaner said he used trichloroethylene. Um, it's not something that was uh, used. I'm assuming that he bought it because that's what was available. Uh, so it is a degradation product of the perchloroethylene. So that's why we find it at sites. Okay. Next question. How likely, how likely is, is it that a plume from a historic dry cleaner exists below the cleaner that ceased operations before environmental regulations? I'm going to give you my own statistic on this. It's near 100% uh, if there was a PERC dry cleaner. And again, talking specifically about PERC dry cleaners, I've looked at over 500, almost 600 dry cleaners, and I've only found two that did not have contamination. One of them had a steel pan under the, under the uh, area, not just the dry cleaning equipment, but the whole area that the dry cleaning operation was conducted. So everything was conducted within that steel pan area. Uh, we even looked at two dry cleaners that had only been in operation for less than two years, fifth generation equipment at both of them. Both of them had soil contamination, not necessarily groundwater contamination. Okay. Uh, next question, can you speak to the cookers and how they apply to permitted treatment of hazardous waste under RECRA? So um, I'm assuming there's, there's two things in there. There's the uh, evaporative cooker where they put water in the, uh, they put the separator water into a vat, boil it off and, um, and evaporate the material. Um, as long as that doesn't generate a waste stream, that would not be considered a reprohazardous waste. But if you took that water and put that water in a drum and went to get rid of that water, that, uh, then that would be considered a hazardous waste. The still bottoms that come off the steel or the cooker within the dry cleaning equipment, that is from a perk machine and from a stoddard solvent machine are both hazardous waste. The perk is hazardous by spent uh, halogenated solvents and the uh, Stoddard solvent is a, is a flammable uh, uh, waste. So they have two different uh, waste classifications. Okay, next question. Are the green dry cleaner, what are the green dry cleaners using? So what they're talking about is the solvents in that uh, that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And uh, those solvents typically, I think the most common of those is the CO2 and silicone based um, solvents. Uh, at one time they were labeled as uh, green solvents. I think they have since been removed. Glycol ethers is another one, um, but they are less problematic than the tetrachloroethylene and the, and the Stoddard solvent and uh, typically do not result in any kind of, uh, of contamination from their use, just based on the nature of what we have today and our knowledge of what we know today. Okay. So any change you can touch upon how Stoddard solvents contain TPH in addition to VOCs? So the Stoddard solvents are basically a middle distillate from a refinery. Um, and so when you analyze them, you're going to find the, the methyl benzenes, toluene, you'll find these compounds that are in there. So when you analyze for the 
broader list of uh, VOCs, these types of compounds will show up. But the uh, driver is again, normally we're using total uh, petroleum hydrocarbons or TPH. So those are the two analytical procedures that we would use to analyze for those compounds. Okay. In my limited investigations of dry cleaners, I found more contamination outside by dumpsters rather than underneath equipment. Is that your experience? So I don't know where in the country you are. Um, I would say that that is not an unexpected uh, issue. Uh, we typically find wherever they're storing the waste, uh, the dumpster apparently where you did the investigation was probably where they were disposing. And even today, uh, because again, it's such a low dollar industry, um, dry cleaners are still illicitly getting rid of, of the waste. Uh, the picture of the nice looking dry cleaner with the two machines in it, I mean, this is a high-end dry cleaner, uh, very cautious, have detailed records of their purchases and sales. I go to dry cleaners where they've never gotten rid of waste and they say they, they tell me they have a super efficient piece of equipment. So they're dumping that waste somewhere. It is going somewhere and the dumpster is a likely spot for it to go to. Okay. So how do laundry sites we often see come about on the 1880s and 1920 fire insurance maps compared to those dry cleaning facilities we commonly see posted in the 1950s? So the early dry cleaners from the say early 1900s, late 1800s, would have been using Stoddard solvent. Uh, again, that solvent back in the day was highly flammable, had a very high volatilization rate. I have not found, uh, in fact, in, in all the dry cleaners that we've done in, in uh, quite a few Stoddard solvent one, it's very rare to find one that actually triggers a cleanup. Uh, we did have one uh, that was on a military base um, and it may have been just due to the pure volume of, of uh, Stoddard solvent that they were using, but I typically don't find those to be drivers for significant environmental costs like the, uh, like the perchloroethylene. Plus the contaminant is very similar to what we find at gas station sites, and those are significantly less cost than any dry cleaner site. Okay. Is it appropriate to start analyzing samples for PFAS in addition to solvents, given that waste solvents may contain PFAS that originated on the fabrics being laundered? I've seen some preliminary research being conducted, but I am curious of the industry opinion, opinion on that matter. That's a, I, I, that is a very good question. Um, I think that we will be analyzing for PFOS compounds within the next two years at dry cleaner sites. It's kind of like when 1,4-dioxane came on the market, all of the solvent sites that we went back and looked at 1,4-dioxane, we're gonna be looking for PFOS, especially given the, the new standards that have come out for PFOS, they're extremely low, um, their dioxin level uh, standards. So, I think we're going to find that more and more. Should you be doing it today? I just think that's a conversation between you and your client on, on where they are and then potentially with your state regulators. Okay. Please discuss the best areas to sample and how inside a dry clean and how inside a dry cleaning shop. I think that we you know, please discuss the best areas to sample inside a dry cleaning shop. So the, uh, the dry cleaning equipment, um, the dry cleaning machine, the best place to take the samples is behind the piece of equipment. Uh, as you saw in that one picture uh, that we had, the dry cleaning machine is very close to the back wall. That means you're gonna have to have someone come in, potentially pour a hole in the slab, or you may not be able to get there. And so then you're stepping outside that, and hopefully that's an outside wall and not the wall to an adjoining uh, tenant space. If you cannot get behind the dry cleaning machine, then the sides of the front would be the next place. I would, again, you're gonna bring a core in there, uh, core a hole through the slab, 
uh, and you may be hand augering inside the dry cleaner because uh, again, a dry cleaner has closed racks, which only have a, have a height of about uh, less than six feet. I know that because I hit my head on the racks all the time and I'm six foot two. So again, it's going to be dealing with the confines of the dry cleaner space. Uh, sometimes you can get some small probe rigs in there, but generally that kind of work is going to be done outside the dry cleaner. So inside we typically hand auger or use some sort of mechanical augering device to take the samples inside uh, through a cord hole in the concrete slab. Okay. Next are PFAS chemicals in household laundry detergents. I did look that up because that was, a, again, an excellent question. Um, again, there's some suggestions that it is in household laundry. Uh, and if you've never been in a dry cleaner, uh, when you go in there, uh, you're going to find the bucket of Tide. You're going to find that they use the same laundry detergents that we use at home in the laundry uh, for doing their wet laundry. So given what we have, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and again, but it's in a lot of items that are potentially are, are, you know, the no stick surfaces on our pots and pans too. And the wa uh, waterproofing or product proofing on our clothes. Okay. Why are boiler rooms a potential source area? So a lot of the dry cleaners have a, uh, had a device, a sniffer or a device that was used to collect uh, steam coming off of the equipment. Sometimes this steam would contain perk. They would discharge that. It's also uh, the boilers had a, had a drain on them. They had a bleed. So there was a purge line on the boiler to get the solids out of the boiler. And Again, that room is generally right next to the dry cleaning equipment, so you minimize the cost of putting in pipes. There's a drain, I need to get rid of a five gallon bucket of water. The dry cleaner will carry the bucket in there and dump it in there uh, and dispose of it down the drain in the boiler room. Okay, what are the risks with the new wet cleaning processes that are being used now? I wish I, I knew the answer to that. I'm, I'm not that familiar with them yet. Um, I've looked into a little bit. I, I know Mille is one of the companies that is uh, developing equipment and I'm not that familiar with the actual soaps or surfactants that they're using in the process to be able to answer that question. Okay. Aren't the lint traps attached as part of the dry cleaning machine? So the lint trap is part of the wet laundry and um, usually municipalities would require the lint trap to get rid of the uh, fibers and stuff that were being discharged out of the wet laundry off of the wet equipment and not from the dry cleaning equipment. A lot of these bigger laundries had a sump and they would take and they would dump their water down the sump or the drain and that's how these lint traps end up being, but they're part of the wet laundry system, not part of the uh, dry laundry uh, of the uh, dry cleaning system. Now, on the dry cleaning equipment, there is a filter within the dry cleaning equipment that collects things like buttons and things that are in the clothes that come out and they call it a button trap. Some people have, I've heard call it a lint trap, but it's really designed to catch material as it's the uh, uh, solvent is being circulated in the equipment. Okay. Um, does PERC always break down through vinyl chloride during remediation process, for example, through oxidation? Well, the oxidation process uh, would be a, a direct destruction of the compound itself, but through biological degradation, predominantly through biological degradation, the perchloroethylene uh, degrades into trichloroethylene, the trichloroethylene degrades into uh, cis and trans one, two, and very little under certain conditions can become one, one uh, dichloroethylene. And then those compounds can break down into vinyl chloride. And of course the vinyl chloride can break down into uh, ethane and ethene, so. Okay. 
Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's presentation. Um, however, though, Mike has agreed to uh, answer the remaining questions that were not answered live. So be on the lookout for that, and those will be posted on our website. So on behalf of ARIS and our audience community, I'd like to give a big thank you to our presenter, Mike McCrone, for the knowledge and experience he shared with us today. And to our audience, we want to thank you for your attention during this past hour. Please note this webinar has been recorded and will be available along with the slides on the ARIS website tomorrow. To read more about dry cleaning, please visit ARIS Info Hub on arisinfo.com, which contains many curated articles on emerging contaminants. The link should be included in the chat. Once there, use the filter tag emerging contaminants. Also, to stay current on other due diligence topics, bookmark Info Hub and subscribe to our webinars located there. ARIS will host, will hold an online demo of its new Scriba report writing platform next Tuesday, July 26 at 2 p.m. Eastern. Visit ARIS Info Hub forward slash webinars to register. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.